as I as I said, I'll I'll just tackle the uh, the present context. Uh, I will give well just a few slides on 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 how I see the present context and and the crossroads that where we are at, and therefore the the opportunity, the need to really make choices about where our nation will go. And then, uh, given a bit more time, I'd like to um, turn over to attorney Anna Basman, who heads our legal team of the panel, to just give a little bit more on the BBL itself. So I won't handle the, uh, the, the, the technical part of the BBL. And because um, uh, Chair Iqbal has already also covered um, some of the main issues in the BBL. It will also be a short presentation, but we wanted to also take the opportunity just to um, address some of the issues that are being raised against the BBL. <clears throat> but um, uh, maybe the maybe uh, well, people are confused why. Uh, what certainly what what has what has happened is that. Uh, it has become a conflagration of emotions, of issues, really very high, uh, uh, very high levels of of debate and and discourse uh, that seems um, much of which is focused on the BBL, but is not really about the BBL. And uh, I think it's important to understand that context. What has really happened here with Mama Sapano uh, in terms of BBL? Uh, because uh, it may help to explain the confusion that sometimes seems to be there and why we need to thresh out uh, what is happening, what are the different tracks that are happening, and address the ones that we need to address in order to put the BBL uh, back on track. And the first thing that, that is clear is that uh, what has happened is not just about the BBL. What has, what has happened with the with the uh, Mama Sapano tragedy on January, in, gen in late January, has sparked um, a confluence of many tracks that were already moving even before this. <clears throat> and one of these tracks very clearly is an anti-Pinoy track. We know that that's there. It was there since, since the president took office. There are people who did not want the president to succeed. And I won't go anymore into who are these groups, but we know that they have been there and have been looking for opportunities since 2010 to find an issue that could be thrown to the president uh, that would weaken him uh, and, if possible, even, even shorten the term. No? So that was there, and it wasn't quite hitting. Uh, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't gelling. It, wasn't, it did not have uh, real traction among the public. But we know that there is that group that has not wanted the president to succeed. And if you do not want the president to succeed, certainly you don't want the peace agenda to succeed. Because to succeed in ending the armed conflict in, in Muslim Mindanao would certainly make a very strong president and a very strong legacy and a very strong voice in determining who will, uh, who will, who will lead in the succeeding years. So that's there. There, but there was also, we do know that from the, from the hearings that had already been held on the BBL and all of the consultations, that there, is, there was also an anti-BBL or an anti-Bank Samoro uh, track that was also there but not quite uh, gaining ground. Apparently, uh, this is rooted in some um, anti-Muslim bias or, or prejudice. Uh, that had quieted a bit, but we is now again in full uh, in full flow. Uh, and there are others who are afraid of the Bang Samoro, maybe because they live too near it and don't know what it will mean for them, or it will dislodge or open up um, a democratic arena in the Bang Samoro, which would um, undermine old uh, you know, traditional uh, power holders. So there were also that. So speaking up against BBL, uh, but again, also not gaining traction. And then with the, as the 1916 elections comes, then you also have the dynamics of 19, uh, 2016, rather. 2016 
national electoral ambitions of people who want to make sure that in the elections in 2016 they will be a um, they will be in contention in serious contention and looking for a platform on which to come into the national scene and be recognized these these three are dynamics that were in place somehow each each track trying to find its way to hitting its target but not finding an issue until Mama Sapano happened. And that brought all of this together. And that's why what you have here is really a confusion of agenda um, and anything goes because you want to hit. Uh, there are different agenda at work. Yeah, so with the Mama Sapano crisis, of course it was a moment of grief uh, for all of us. But grief turned to anger and then distrust and uh, to the point, I think that we can speak of um, quite a, a, a resurgence or a threat, at least, of anti-Muslim bigotry uh, with some of what has been coming. And all of this is now being used, being harnessed towards these two agenda. One is to um, weaken the president, even oust him if possible. And the other one is to stop the peace process, which are interlinked. A successful peace process strengthens the president. A weakened president weakens uh, the initiative for the BBL. So that is, um, uh, those, those two dynamics are in this, uh, in this agenda, which are at work now. And that, um, <clears throat> which is uh, because the agenda is so strong, it's so emotional, uh, it is perhaps for some parties a, a, a do or die thing. If they do not succeed, if the president remains strong up to 2016, and the president will be able to uh, uh, will be able to be a strong voice in determining who will follow him, which is another term of tuwid na daan, then what happens to all of the people that have been affected by the tuwid na daan? So everything has been used, no? Uh, lies, mis deliberate misinformation, where some of which we will uh, tackle later and then we'll uh, certainly be open to questions. There's the public shaming of people who have been defending the uh, peace process and standing up for it, including cyberbullying. So everything is used now, uh, uh, resulting in really a, a, a great confusion among the public not really knowing whom to believe. Every headline that says this is what it will be, even if it is not based on fact, is taken as fact because people don't know enough about it. And so we need to, this is a good thing that we, uh, we really need to start clarifying this, and understand the agenda that are at work and keep focus on what we need to focus on. <clears throat> what has been the impact on the BBL? Uh, Chair Iqbal has... Um, <clears throat> has mentioned um, already that shortened timeline, and I will go through that. And then the threat to stop or dilute it. No? So it's a shortened time, timeline, but uh, people are still working that it is not just a shortened timeline, but that you stop BBL entirely. What does a shortened timeline mean? Uh, you know that we had hoped that by March, the BBL would have been Passed, no? so that the plebiscite would have been held by June, uh, that would have given one year for the, trans the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. Of course, we know it could not be passed in March anymore, the new deadline. And this is a deadline, uh, or a timetable, rather, that has been set by the Congress leadership themselves when they discussed it. This was not... Uh, this is not an OPAP set deadline. It was a deadline set by the leadership that they are working to have the law passed by June 11, 2015, which is the last day of Congress before it closes. And when it next opens, it will be the SONA already. And after the SONA, you have already the budget hearing. So that is their target. Within this timetable, well, we just finished the Lenten and Easter uh, recess uh, no we are, yeah no the Easter recess is still ongoing 
up to up to May 3. Uh, May 4 is when Congress reopens. So you have a six week uh, of possible plenary. Uh, the ple uh, if the, the June 11 will allow a plebiscite by September, which is important because by October, uh, those who are running for 2016, for the 2016 elections, will be filing their candidacies. So after the candidacies are filed, it is hard to still wiggle in um, a plebiscite and everything that needs else needs to happen. If this succeeds, then you will have a BTA term. The Bangsamoro Transition Authority will have a term from October 2015 to June 2016, which, uh, as already said, is less than the one year uh, that had originally been hoped for. So, so it is a um, tight uh, timetable. Uh, uh, latest timetable, just so also you know what, you will, what I hope you will decide to monitor very closely. I hope you will want to be there. I hope you will want to be at Congress to make your uh, statement felt uh, in the halls of Congress. Tomorrow, there will be a two-day two -day hearings, again on Mama Sapano, in the, in the House of Representatives. And knowing how that went, the first round of, of, of the hearings on Mama Sapano in the House, which they adjourned after one day, uh, then we don't really know what we can expect. Uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, that is where we will, the GPH team and the MIL team will be together with all of those who had already been called to the Senate also and spent many days there. Uh, the, this will still be recess period, but the House uh, has set in its timetable the executive session to continue the deliberations, to now resume the deliberations on the uh, draft BBL from April 20 to April 30. So they hope to complete the committee deliberations in the House by the end of April 30, but the voting will be already when Congress resumes, so that there it will be, the voting will be already have um, everyone there on May 5 and 6. And then May 11 to 12, so the committee hopefully will pass uh, the draft uh, BBL by May 5 or 6 so that there will be a plenary vote on May 11 to 12. So I hope you are planning to be there at the plenary uh, in, in, the, in the committee when they make the vote on May 5 and 6 and on May 11 and 12 at the plenary. That, that uh, when we hope it, uh, the BBL will, we will, will be passed. In the Senate, we only know at this time that the resumption of the Joint Committee hearings will start on April 13. Uh, in the Senate, since they stopped their deliberations as soon as uh, Mama Sapano tragedy happened, uh, they still have public hearings. So I don't know how many more public hearings they will have. On April 13, the invitation says that the public hearing will be about the ceasefire, uh, about the ceasefire mechanisms. So we don't know yet where that will go. But by the decision of both the Senate and the House leadership, they want to bring this to a vote by, on third reading already by June 11. So that is the timetable in which we are working, and every day counts, as, 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 as you will note, because every day of further postponement um, makes us hit that, that, that wall of, of June 11. <clears throat> so there is the shortened timeline, but there are also the threats uh, to the BBL. We know that there are the many voices, or at least noisy voices, that talk about stopping the BBL because they say it's unconstitutional uh, when the reality is provisions can be clarified to make sure it stands uh, constitutional test. Of course, we know uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, the GPH is concerned, it went through a constitutional check. <clears throat> 
But nevertheless, certainly language can be improved. They say that it should be stopped because the MILF is not sincere. It is the wrong partner because it killed our staff. Uh, then they say we should not have it because once you have the Bank Samoro, it will lead to secession and independence and the entry of ISIS. Already that has been responded to by Chair Iqbal, but that is uh, one of the things that is being peddled. And that the peace process, sometimes some people go as far as, say, as saying that the peace process and the peace panel specifically are responsible for Mama Sapano. Therefore, they should not be trusted. The whole peace process should not be trusted. And you should just drop this whole thing. There is another, uh, there is another call that is uh, not saying stop the BBL. It is saying just stall it. We should have the justice for the SAF 44 first before you go through the BBL. But we know if you, you know, then you need to ask the question, what, what does justice mean? If you want to see if that justice means you, you have to have people in jail already, prosecuted and convicted, then practically you're saying no BBL because certainly that cannot happen so quickly. Due process takes more time and we need to get this process moving. And then there is the other one that says, okay, if it will pass, but it has to be diluted because you cannot give it, you cannot give what uh, MILF asks for. This is too much. This is a, a substate. And dilution really means you remove the CAB provisions, the provisions that were already agreed on in the CAB. The major issues as they have been picked up in media, and of course there are others, but these are the ones that are constantly being um, out there now as to why the BBL needs to be seriously amended are the provisions on constitutional bodies, on the Bangsamoro police, and the so-called 70 billion uh, pork barrel. Uh, I, uh, Attorney Anna will, will, will cover uh, some of that. Uh, plus, there is that opt-in provision that some of the contiguous areas, possible contiguous areas, are very afraid of. What is the GPH position on, on this? Just to make it clear. On the legislative power and process, first of all, we say that the BBL was never rushed. I think PCEC would be one of those organizations because, as I said, they have been constantly, steadfastly accompanying us, knows that this was not rushed that uh, there were many times, in fact, that we were so afraid that we would, we would not be able to push it through precisely because the negotiations were so difficult. And the BBL itself underwent uh, major, uh, the BTC draft, as you know, underwent major changes before its submission to Congress because that went through um, a process with the Office of the President. It has uh, undergone, by the count, by the last count of uh, Congressman uh, Rufus Rodriguez, who heads the ad hoc committee on BBL, it has already held 36 public hearings, not just in Congress, but many in Mindanao, but also in the Visayas and Luzon. He wanted to make sure that no one would say, as was said about the MOA AD, that it did not go through consultations. And therefore, this draft BBL has undergone more consultations than any other law enacted by Congress already. There is no such law that has gone through the level of consultations that has already happened with the BBL. So it is not true that it was rushed. <clears throat> we also maintain that pursuit of negotiated political settlement of armed conflicts is under executive power and Prerogative. Certainly, by the constitutional provision that says that war is not an, a, an option, a policy option, renounces war as a policy option, that's the, what the Constitution says, that this is a power of the executive and the commander-in-chief. Just as the commander-in-chief can call out the army to wage war, it can also decide to do peace negotiations. So it is not true that the executive cannot do peace negotiations. It has done so. Uh, 
It is in the Constitution and it has done so since 1987 when the President Cory uh, first uh, did the negotiations with the um, CPP and NDF. Of course, we know the Tripoli Agreement that was also an executive uh, that was an executive under executive power and prerogative. But this particular agreement involves submitting salient provisions to the legislative process to make this part of Philippine law. Thus, we have the BBL. So the agreement between the MILF and the executive said that parts of this agreement has to go to Congress to become part of the, of the Philippine law. And we submitted and we agree. We submit that Congress has the sole power of legislation. And from the start, if you will go back to the first hearings, the opening hearings, both in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, I always made my opening remarks asking that the Houses of Congress scrutinize this law, work in it, debate it, because we said we want a law passed that is the best BBL that can be passed by Congress. We did not want it to be, as they say, RA 9054 is, that in the end it was just left to Congress, even just to a segment of Congress, and no one would be ready to defend it. We wanted this law thoroughly discussed and debated so that when it was passed, we knew that we had full Congress behind it. So what is the GPH commitment if this is the process of legislation that it will go through? The executive, by signing the FAB and the CAB, is committed to harness all its powers under the Philippine law and the Constitution and use all its political capital towards the full implementation of the CAB. What does that mean? It means that it will certify as urgent. You, you know that the, that the submission of the draft BBL to Congress was done at a very high level in Malacanang itself with the president present. That is, that, that is already part of showing that we are using, the executive is using all its powers and political capital uh, for the passage of this law. So it, uh, in, at, the, at the time when it is uh, passed by or adopted by the committee, then it will be certified. That is technically how that goes. And the full lobby of Congress will happen. Executive will lobby Congress together with everyone else. It means the executive will defend it in court, should it ever be brought up in court. And that with the executive will help in the campaign for the ratification and ensure that democratic elections are held in 2016. That is the commitment of the executive. It does not take away from the powers of Congress. But we will do everything to make sure that the BBL that is passed by Congress is consistent to the cab that was signed by the GPH with MILF. The GPH call has never been do not change or amend the BBL draft. That has never been our call. Our call is do not dilute the cab in the BBL. Because if you dilute the cab in the BBL, then it will not resolve the Mangsamoro problem, as had already been stated. Now, so we have never said that Congress could not touch, as, it has been, as, as is being said now, that we had said you cannot even touch a period or a comma. That is not true. And the uh, MILF has also said, of course, we want this to be improved. So we never said that it could not be touched. But what we will fight for is that the cab provisions are not diluted in the BBL that will be passed because otherwise it will not resolve uh, the armed conflict. So where are we with all of these uh, sentiments, the heightened uh, debate that has happened? I will, I, will, uh, I will picture it as really uh, being that we are a nation now at the crossroads. And we really have to make a decision because the option for war is really there. Is that the option we will choose, or do we want the continued pursuit of peace? It is a cross, crossroads between allowing bigotry to take over, 
Or shall we celebrate cultural diversity? Which we are inevitably, the Philippines is inevitably a place of cultural diversity. Because just by our geographic topography, we cannot but be different, have different ways of living. If you live in a small island, you are different from being someone that comes from the Cordilleras or from the Central Plains. Your whole way of life changes just by that. And then that there is that history that was already recounted. Shall we have bigotry, the distrust of others who are not like us? Or shall we celebrate cultural diversity? Do we have heightened distrust or do we take the leap of faith? Again, certainly there are no guarantees here. We have to continue work hard, to work hard at it. But do we prefer that we embrace continuing distrust? Or shall we take the leap of faith into the possibility of the future that may open up for us? It is a choice, I think. Uh, at this crossroads, do we take the short-term interest of politicians or do we take the long-term interest of Filipino children everywhere? The child in Makati and Manila equal to the child in Mama Sapano. What is the choice going to be? Because we know whose voices are loud. But we know we have to decide who are we listening to. Do we listen to the children do we listen to that valedictorian in Mama Sapano who called for peace? Or do we listen and take the calls for war that are very loud in Congress? The opportunity, I think, that presents itself to us, as is presented with every crossroads, is to be able to transform the crisis, to bring us to a place where peace will happen, not simply on the wings of unexplained euphoria, where obviously it was. People were happy when we signed the cab. There was such widespread acceptance of it. But obviously, now we know that that was some measure of largely unexplained euphoria. People didn't really know. They were just happy that, some, that it looked like it was being resolved. We, are, we now have the opportunity to move from such kind of unexplained euphoria to everyone or the broadest number of Filipinos out of the studied and deliberate decision, make a decision, out of study and deliberation, make the decision that peace is the only way to, a future, to our future where we can, united, not divided, face and overcome the new challenges now shaping the world. And that is why me, I continue to say, despite the fact of how much battered we are, I take the trust that we will make our choice and that we will end up with a better BBL, we will, wake, we will end up with a stronger peace process because there are many more people who will with study and deliberation, make the choice for peace and not just leave it to their leaders so that when there is a problem that comes up, they look for someone to blame. They look for people who will resign. We want a peace process where many Filipinos will stand up for it. And when there is a problem, they will say, I will be part of that solution. Can we still do it? My answer is yes. And I have to say here, of course, that I am an optimist. Uh, that is my work. That is my lifeblood, is to have faith and hope and trust. And on that basis, I say yes. But there are bases for that. One is that the two parties remain committed to the peace process. That is so clear. With Mama Sapano, without that commitment to the peace process, what we would be having now in central Mindanao would be another conflagration of war. It is only the commitment of the two parties that have kept us on track and the ceasefire still holding. Pinoy still retains substantial political capital. I maintain that, including political capital for 2016. The top leaders of the most influential social institutions are speaking up, have spoken up. Uh, Chair Iqbal listed some of those groups. The international community is fully supportive and engaged, 
And most important, ordinary Filipinos are standing up and taking action. I, they don't get into the front pages all the time, but we know that the number of rallies that have been held, the marches, uh, the, the standing up for peace, the signing up of petitions, is at an un unprecedented level. People, ordinary Filipinos are saying, now I will stand up for this. And, uh, well, <clears throat> the peace panels, the peace teams of both sides, we will continue to be willing to take the blows. We are bat battered, and I am sure we will still be battered in the coming weeks. But I don't think any of us are ready to give up. And for as long as we are standing, then it makes it harder for those who do not want this to continue. Steps moving forward, and this is my last. <clears throat> is there is a already happening is the forging of renewed, refreshed national consensus on a peace process. I think that is happening. That is happening here in this room. That is happening with the Friends of Peace that will launch itself this afternoon at the AIM. We know that there is a National Peace Summit that is happening next week. So it is a renewed consensus that is emerging from this uh, tragedy and crisis. There is the forging of consensus on draft BBL amendments among all stakeholders. We do not have to talk about how that is happening, but uh, that is at work. Then there will be the full press lobby for BBL, where the call to ordinary Filipinos is really be there Lobby, each of us has a congressperson. Make your voice heard to your congressperson. Do not leave it now to the people who are, you know, the regular activists, the usual suspects, as they say. We all have a congressperson. We all voted our senators. We should make ourselves felt through letters, through whatever means. Now is the time to take action. And there will be, there is, I, the, this seems to be what is at work, a massive peace process summer campaign that will be sectoral, multi-sectoral, viral, traditional media, on the street materials handout. We welcome uh, volunteers who will be willing to hand out leaflets. We are coming out with thousands of leaflets to be given out at MRT stops at the corners of the street and grassroots. So that's where we are. We are, in a not, we are not in an easy spot. 